Good morning again. (laughs) We want to continue this morning with our series on things that we wish Jesus had never said. So we've been walking through this series and I'm excited about today's message because it's one of those particular things that Jesus said that it would have been a whole lot easier for us to go through life and not have to pursue healing and wholeness and freedom If Jesus had never said this, if he had never said, do not judge or you will be judged, then we would be free to just go around judging everybody and everything all the time. And that would be a whole lot easier because that's what we already do. (laughs) So instead though, we wish that Jesus had never said, do not judge or you will be judged. Before you Begin to pull out your pen and take notes, because I know you'll take copious amounts of notes from every sermon that I preach. Uh, the, the beginning, the thought that you would have when somebody says, don't judge or you'll be judged, we jump to this idea that this verse is saying that however we judge other people, God is going to judge us that same way. Like, that's what we think of when we read this message, when we read these passages in Matthew chapter 7 and in Luke chapter 6, he's correlating stories of the gospel. We think that what the writers are saying, the disciples when they write this, they're saying that how we treat other people is how God is going to treat us. Well, let me begin by breaking a little news to you. It doesn't matter how you treat other people. God is sovereign and he has his own justice that he will use to judge you. It doesn't matter how good or how bad you are to each other. God has his own justice. And what the gospel writers mean when they write this is completely different. What they're actually saying is that the way that you judge people is how people are going to judge you. And I want to begin by reading to you from Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. It says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now in Luke's gospel, a correlating story here, Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now, I know a lot of people, and I've heard these messages myself, that use these verses to talk about giving financially. That if you give, it'll come back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. What that means is that the way that you give and that what they would say is that if you give financially to this ministry or that ministry or this church or that church, then what's gonna happen is God's gonna return to you, pressed down, shaken together, like get all the occupiable space out of that cup, running over this heaping return is gonna come back to you. And that's not what this is talking about. There is a principle of sowing and reaping that is a reality in the life of a Christian. What you sow, you will reap in return. But this isn't talking about giving financially, it's talking about giving emotionally. It says, if you forgive, then you'll be forgiven. If you pardon, then you'll be pardoned. If you judge, then you'll be judged. With one exception, it doesn't just say how you do it, it'll happen to you. It says how you do it, it will happen to you pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll come back to you in more. How you do it, if you forgive, you will receive a harvest of forgiveness. If you pardon, you'll receive a harvest of pardoning. If you judge, yeah, you'll receive a harvest of judging. So let me just illustrate this with you really quickly. Everybody just humor me and do this with me, okay? Everybody turn to your neighbor and give them the meanest, nastiest, gnarly, grumpy face that you possibly can right now. Okay, now let's do the opposite. Give them the biggest, brightest, warmest, most welcoming smile you possibly can. Go ahead and just give them that 
Oh, come on. You guys are mushy. Woo. That was sweet right there. I, I can't point people out, uh, but that was pretty awesome. Okay, so, I mean, this is what I'm talking about right here. All I did was ask you to smile at each other, and you're laughing, you're having a good time. Like, this small thing comes back to you multiplied over and over and over. And it happens not just with smiles and with grumpy faces, but it also happens with forgiveness and pardoning and judging. And so Jesus said, and I wish that he wouldn't have, but he did. He said, if you judge, how you judge will be judged back to you. And not just how, but a harvest. And it leads us to one of four principles that I want to talk through with you this morning. I want to talk with you about how you can begin to understand how to walk free from judgment in your life. I wish that I had had this message 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 37 years ago. (laughs) I wish that I had understood this. And what I'm telling you today, a lot of it uh, is quotes. Some of it are themes, ideas, or concepts from a book called How to Stop the Pain by Dr. James Richards. This book is available in our bookstore. We don't make any money on stuff we sell in the bookstore. I'm not just pushing product at you. Uh, There's no kick back on my part at all. We just want you to have materials that will encourage and contribute to your growth as a Christian. And this book will absolutely contribute to you understanding how to walk in freedom and wholeness and in peace. And if this message this morning speaks to you at all, I encourage you to stop by the bookstore and pick up a copy. Okay, shameless plug over. The principles that I want to give you this morning, the first one is this. The quality of our emotional life is found in the quality of our relationships. What I mean by that is simply this. The quality of your emotional state and health is directly proportional to the quality of the relationships that are operating in your life. If you look at the relationships in your life and they are negative and they are painful and they are abusive and traumatizing, your emotional health will be a copy of that. It will be negative, and it will be hurt, and it will be punishing, and it will be suffering. If, on the other hand, the relationships in your life are encouraging and strengthening and positive and supportive, then your emotional health will reflect that. It will be positive and encouraging and supportive. Think of it this way. Your life is a garden. And the relationships that you have are seeds that you plant in the garden of your emotional health. And as you go through life, you're planting these seeds. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I like to play with gardening. I've talked about this a few times. Uh, I'm not a master gardener like some, but I do like to play with gardening. And so Ethan and I Remember, this, we're talking about don't judge, okay? So this is a no judgment zone, all right? Ethan and I planted a garden, garden, uh, this year, and uh, we planted four stalks of corn in one little row. And so now when we plant that corn, all of you farmers are like, don't you know they can't cross pollinate if you don't have at least two rows? Of, yeah, well, it's a small garden. So don't judge. Uh, So we planted this corn. Now, when we planned, we put the one little kernel of corn in the hole, and we covered it up, and we water it, and all that stuff. Does that kernel of corn grow to produce one kernel of corn that we get back? No, obviously. It produces ears of corn that we tear off, and shuck, and eat, and grill, and have a good time with. And the same is true of the things in your life. The seeds that you plant, those relationships The seeds that you plant in the relationships in your life don't just grow up. They grow up to produce a harvest back into your life. So the question is, what seeds are you planting? Is it peace, joy, love, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control? Are you catching a theme? Sounds like the fruits of the Spirit. Because that's what we should be reaping out of the relationships in our life our reaction to this principle that our emotional health is directly tied to our relationship with other people, 
our reaction should be in order to walk in a way that is free and whole and healthy, our reaction should be to always seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. If you will just do that, then you can begin to walk in freedom and in wholeness. Because when we first begin to walk trying to understand people and where they're coming from, before we seek to be heard and understood, then we begin to build and sow seeds that will reap a harvest. Now, we didn't plan this. It's not like we set this thing up, so I would preach this message on this particular Sunday. We plan these things out months in advance, and so I didn't plan on speaking about not judging on this particular Sunday, but because I am, I feel like it's very appropriate that I say that there are a lot of things going on in our nation right now in response to the election that just happened. And if we would only apply this principle, there would be a lot of things happening in our nation right now that wouldn't be happening. If we would seek to understand before we proclaim and maintain our position to be understood, we could sow some peace. And in response to that, I believe the church in America would have a huge voice. And you are the church in America. And so if you will do this, if we will put this into practice, if you find someone who is of a different political opinion than you, seek to understand them before you maintain and hold your ground and seek for them to understand you. And let that begin to sow a seed of a positive relationship will reap a harvest in your life. So that's the first principle. And it's the first truth that we talk about this morning. The problem is, though, that we wrongly assume that we have nothing to do with how others treat us. Things happen. Sin and trauma happens to you. Pain happens to you. Things come against you. And we wrongly assume that it has nothing to do with us, when in reality, it has everything to do with us. Most people live their entire lives and never grasp the tools that they need to begin to walk out healing and wholeness. And I pray that maybe for some of you this morning, today is a step in the right direction that you will get something that you can hang on to. You'll get this book or you'll get involved in the discipleship track and you'll begin to walk out understanding and grasping and putting some tools into your tool belt so that you can begin to walk in freedom and health and wholeness. I know what this is like because I've been there. I I know what it's like to live trapped in this cycle of pain that creates more pain. Because when I'm stuck in a place of my hurts and my wounds and my fears and my rejections, then what do I do? I sow seeds of hurt and fear and wound and rejection. And you've all heard it and you know it's true that hurt people hurt people. And so we have a need, a response to step away from that and begin to walk in a different direction. Because the fact is you can't avoid hurt. And you can't avoid pain. In Luke chapter 17, I want to invite you to turn there. Uh, If you'd like to, you can stick your finger in there. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. But in Luke 17, verse 1, Jesus said, offenses are bound to happen. They're going to happen. Your version might say, temptations will come. Or it might say, opportunities to sin will come. Or it might happen. This Good News translation says that offenses are bound to happen. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of life. The fact is, you can't stop pain from happening in your life. What you can stop is how you react to it and what you do with what comes to your life. We don't have any control over the fact that pain's coming into our life. We do have an ability to stop that pain from turning into a long-term suffering that creates in us a need and a desire to see vengeance carried out and bitterness grow in our hearts. You see, when you pass a judgment, what you're doing is you are not only passing a judgment, but you're also the jury, and you pass a verdict, and you're also the sentencer, and you pass a sentence. 
And so when all you do that, when you pass a judgment and you've said, this is it, and then you give them a verdict of guilty, and then you want to see restitution. You want to see vengeance. You want to see revenge for the thing that you've been wronged by because of your judgment. But you can't go there. We can't go there. When Paul writes in Romans, Paul is a guy who has been beaten. He's been drugged outside the city and stoned and left to die. He's been thrown in jail multiple times. He lists off all of this horrible stuff that people have done to him. This is Paul. He is writing in the New Testament, and he's writing all of this horrible things that people have done to him. And he writes in Romans chapter 12, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back, says the Lord. We just sang a song that says, I am yours. I am yours. All that I have, all that I am, I am yours. We just sang a song that says, Lord, give me vision to see things the way that you see them. Give me wisdom to know what to do. If that's true, and if you sing that, not just as words on the screen, but if you sing that from your heart as worship to God, really meaning what you say, then you have to release the right to judge. And that's the second principle. that We have to realize that judgment and consequently punishment belong solely to God. You don't have the right to judge other people. It's not yours to do. Because vengeance, punishment, sentencing belongs solely to God. He is the only one who is really omnipotent. He is the only one that's really all-knowing. He's the only one that can really understand the entire situation. And so because of that, I don't see it completely. And because I don't see it completely, I can't judge. Judgment and consequently punishment belong solely to God. And our response to that is that we must surrender the right to judge. I have to surrender the right to judge. And that's really hard because judging is really easy. And I do it just like that. But we all must surrender the right to judge. In fact, I want you to say this with me. Hear me and maybe this, I know this message is pretty heavy because it's stepping on all of our toes, right? I mean, we all judge people all the time. So it's really difficult to hear a message that says the way that you're acting, you can't do that anymore. That's hard. So I want you to say this with me. Say, I surrender the right to judge. We have to surrender the right to judge. But what is it to judge? What does it mean to pass a judgment? When you identify what someone did, you're just an observer. Now, we should be aware of what's happening in our lives. We shouldn't walk around in naivety, just letting things happen, sin happen to us, trauma happen to us, let people abuse us and let people uh, hurt us in horrible ways and let painful actions come against us and just not pay attention to it. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is, when we see what happens, the what, we're an observer. The problem is the judgment comes when we take that next step and begin to apply a why to it. When we begin to think that we can assume a motive for why that person did what they did. Another way to say that is a judgment is when we add a why to a what. Whatever happens to you, if you assume to know why someone did that, you're passing a judgment. Because in reality, only God really knows. I might say to myself, well, I wonder why Tommy wore a suit coat today. Well, it must be because there's a baby dedication at the end of this service. But I don't really know. I don't, maybe he was cold this morning when he got up. I don't have any idea why he wore a suit coat. But I pass a judgment on that. And we do it all the time. 
We judge more than we realize. We pass judgment and we assume we know people's motives and why they do things more than we are even really thinking about. We judge everything and everyone all the time. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, Jeremiah writes and says, The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, there are times when I don't even know the motives of my own heart. There are times when I, in my depravity and in my sin and in my crookedness of my own life, the depravity of my own heart, I understand what Jeremiah is saying. He's saying, who can know the wickedness that's inside of me? And if I don't know me and I can't judge my own motives purely, then how can I assume to have the right to judge you and your motives and your heart? You can't do it. Jesus said, don't judge or you'll be judged. It will come back to you and not just come back to you, but it'll come back in full, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's a whole lot of judgment because of our judgments, because we assume to know why. Instead, we can't do it. Nothing that happens outside of us has the power to hurt us until we attach significance to it. I want you to understand this, and I want you to grab a hold of this, because it is the crux of everything that I want to say this morning. When you begin to judge someone, when you begin to understand and assume that you know the why behind what they're doing, and you pass a judgment, that judgment is tied to an emotional connection, whether it's anger or frustration or bitterness or whatever it might be. There there are positive emotions too. And when we do that, we attach significance to that event. So when I pass judgment, then that significance becomes important to me, and now I've given that event an opportunity to hurt me. And that's the third principle that I want to share with you this morning. Nothing has the power to hurt you until you attach significance to it. Passing judgment on another person's actions is only done in your judgment. It's not done in the reality of the actual event. And so when I pass judgment on anyone, what I'm doing is I'm allowing my understanding of what I see to be what I assume is the reality of that, and I pass a judgment. You've heard the saying, perception is reality. Well, that's not really the truth. The reality is the reality. The perception is just the way that you see it. And so our reaction to this principle, nothing has the power to hurt you, until you attach significance to it. Our reaction is that how I see things is just how I see it. It's not how it really is. And that's so important for us to understand. How I see it is not how it is. It's just how I see it. If you can understand that, if you can wrap your mind around that when things happen to you, whether it's painful or hurtful or good, it doesn't matter. How you see it is not what really is, it's just how you see it. I have a perfect example of this because it's ridiculously stupid, and at the same time, it illustrates this point perfectly. So last Thursday, uh, I was headed up here to the church, and Thursdays are usually uh, our day off, and so I ran up here because I'd forgotten my keys here on Wednesday night when we had 201, and so I ran up here to grab my keys, and I was here at the church for a little bit and uh, talked to Mark Davis and kind of did a few things, and I was supposed to go to the grocery store from here. I was going to head to the grocery store and pick up a few things and then move on about our day, and as I'm leaving the church, I'm driving on the road, I'm headed to the grocery store, I get this text from Steph, and it says, have you left the church yet? Question mark. And my judgment immediately passes. Did you know that the human brain is capable of computing 10 quadrillion processes a second? That's a whole lot of judgments that we can pass in just like that. And we do it. I think that there are times in my life when I've passed all 10 quadrillion have been judgments at one time. And in that moment, I get this text message from Steph and... 
It says, have you left the church yet? Question mark. And I immediately judge the context and the content of that text negatively. Now, another side note here, text messages, emails, really, really bad to try to judge because you can't hear infliction, you don't know tone, you don't know what else is going on. And all of that just gives lots of fodder for easy judgments. So I passed this judgment that says, she's already mad at me because she thinks that I'm still at the church and she thinks that because I'm still at church, I'm not gonna get to the grocery store, I'm not gonna get the things we need to do. So the other plans we had today are gonna get pushed back. And so she's mad at me because she thinks that I'm still at the church, goofing around. I probably got stuck checking email or talking to somebody or saw something needed to be done. And all of that, this whole blown up, out of proportion thing, I passed the judgment on just like that. Luckily, Holy Spirit had been working this message in me for a while, and I was able to stop and say, whoa, that is a judgment. <laughs> I have no idea why she sent that message. Maybe she wants to know if I'm still at the church because she needs something from the church. I don't know. And so I simply replied back and said, I'm on my way to the grocery store. And her reply was a little animated gif of Doctor Who giving me two thumbs up. And that's it. Like there was nothing in it. There was no explosion of, oh, I can't believe you're not at the grocery store yet. And why are I, I need some eggs. And like none of that. It was a judgment that I passed because I allowed that one text message. And get this, understand this. My response to that scenario could have changed everything. It is very probable that the rest of my day could have gone downhill from 9 a.m. Yeah. But in the Holy Spirit's wisdom, he stopped that, thankfully. And I was able to see the judgment that I had made. Because here's the other thing about that. What we do with judgments, how we respond to them, is not just in that moment. We don't ever go back to the original originating event for the judgment and the pain. We go back to the emotion that we had tied to the last time we had that judgment. And the thing about our brain and that 10 quadrillion processes per second is that all of those things appear to be in reality at that moment when you rethink them. All of your subconscious appears real to you at that moment. So every time you go back and relive that event, that thing that you've judged and is causing pain in your life, it's as if you went through it for the first time again and again and again. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen on Sunday mornings, three minutes before church starts. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off because there's things that need to be done. And the video's not downloaded or we got to get this on the screen or somebody needs this announced or that announced or I'm supposed to remember that thing or this thing or whatever. And so in that, I'm running around, and I don't stop to say hi to someone. It seems like a big deal, or a not a big deal, but one of the positive and kind of the plus and minuses of the job is that I love to be in connection with so many people every week. I love to be connected with people and talk to people and find out how you're doing and what's going on with your life. But with two services and over 500 people on Sunday morning, there's no way that I'm going to be able to connect with everybody at that moment. But somebody, if I walk past you and I don't say hi to you, and then you get offended. Well, he didn't even say hi to me this morning. I don't think he likes me. The judgment was, the action, the what was, I didn't say hi. The judgment was, he must not like me. Then later this afternoon, that person will say, man, that pastor just doesn't like me. You know, I don't think he likes anybody. Man, that pastor, and then tomorrow morning, that pastor doesn't like anybody. In fact, I don't think that whole church doesn't love anybody. And then later this week, they're telling their coworkers, I went to that church once and I can't, you won't believe those people just don't love anybody. You know, it's funny, but it's also the truth. And I've seen it happen. People leave this incredible family of fellowship and faith over something so insignificant as the pastor didn't say hi to them when they walked through the foyer because it was three minutes before service started and there were some things that needed to happen because the value that we attach, the significance that we put to those moments 
we have a choice. And that's the fourth principle. And the final one, my reaction is the determining factor between whether this is a temporary pain or a long-term suffering. It's all about your response to the individual event. When you go back and you look at that thing, how you respond and how you react, I could have responded completely differently to that text message to Steph, and it would have gone ill with me, for me. Or I could have responded, thankfully, the way that I did, and nothing happened. I told you we'd come back to Luke 17, and I want to read this to you. Jesus said to his disciples, offenses are bound to happen, but how terrible for the one who makes them happen. It would be better for him if a large rock were tied around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch what you do. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in one day and each time he comes to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Jesus only in one little verse focuses on the offender, the violator here. The rest of it, he says, watch what you do. And then he spends three verses talking to us about our response to being offended. And you could be saying, wait, wait a minute. Why should I watch what I do? I'm the victim here. I'm the one that should be watched out for. What about him? Where's that rock? You should be tying around his neck and throwing him into the sea. You just passed a judgment. You just assumed that you knew what he was doing, why he was doing it, and this is the response. This is the punishment he should get for it. That's exactly what Jesus is pointing out here. He says, watch what you do. Watch your response when offense comes against you, because it will. You can't deny that. It's going to happen. But the bottom line, the most critical component, the key factor is simply, what is your response? What's your reaction to this event. And so we think that other people's behavior is not really about us at all, but in reality, it has everything to do with us. You know, it came as somewhat of a surprise to me when I found out that I'm not as important as I think that I am, that the world does not revolve around me the way that I thought that it did. When I began to realize that other people are not responding to me, they're responding out of themselves. And so it's about how I respond to myself, not about what I do to them. I can't pass judgment. I can't claim to know that I understand their motive, their why, for why they do anything. I can only trust that God will take care of that. I trust God that he will be vengeance, that he will take care of that. And I choose not to judge, to step out of situations and be able to just look at the what and observe without passing a why. And when you do that, if you will take that opportunity, if you will relinquish your right to judge and you will begin to trust God and you'll begin to see people and seek to understand them before you're understood. And then you'll begin to control only how you react to a situation. You'll open a door for an amazing opportunity for God's grace and his mercy to allow healing and freedom to come into your life. And when it comes into your life, you're planting those seeds into the lives of others. Father, we thank you for what you're doing and how you're moving at Destiny Life. And Father, I pray right now, all across this room, that you would speak to us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to take a moment and ask you this morning to look back over your life. Are there moments, and there are, we all have them, are there times in your life when you have made a judgment, when you've assumed to know the motive and the why behind what someone did. And because of that, you've attached emotions and it's become significant. 
And because of its significance, it's continued to create pain in your life. And I want to ask you this morning, right where you are, to give those events to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead us and guide us in all truth and that you will show us the truth of those events, those wounds, those traumas, those offenses that have come and caused us pain. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak into that and that you would heal us as we release every emotion that we've tied to a judgment that we've made. We release those judgments and we ask you to heal our emotions and repair our heart and help us to begin to walk in a path of peace without passing judgment. Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for us. Because of his death, we have been forgiven. And because we are forgiven, every pain can be taken away. We don't have to live trapped in a cycle, a vicious cycle of pain and torture that creates pain and torture because hurt people hurt people. We can be healed. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be healing us this morning and releasing us from the pain of judgments. Thank you what you've given to us through your word, that you've told us not to judge or we would be judged. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.